Last time on Low Budget Binge. In occasions like this, I like to begin with the positive. Nests really aren't that exciting. For me, that's something worth crowing about. While there are tons of swears, it's nothing kids most likely don't already know. But this story, which lauds the writing of its leads and mentions cliches in every criticism, ironically isn't written well and is full of cliches. And now, the next death defying chapter of Low Budget Binge. Welcome back to ML Miller Frights, a part of the Kings of Horror Network. I'm ML Miller. While you might be watching this video on the Kings of Horror Network, I urge you to click over to my ML Miller Frights page and give it a like, share with your buddies across the electronic superhighway, click subscribe to this channel, and don't forget to ring that bell for notifications. Please get the word out to new folks so we can make the Kings of Horror Network, as well as ML Miller Frights, bigger and better. Low Budget Binge is where we venture down the paths less traveled and look at low budget, no budget, do-it-yourselves, and sometimes international films that never get that top billing you see in the usual Hollywood releases. I'll indicate in the review and down below where you can find these films along with their trailers. First up is The Giant, its new on-demand and digital download from Vertical Entertainment. The Giant was written and directed by David Raboy. Recently graduating from high school, Charlotte, played by Odessa Young, should be on top of the world. But instead, she's burdened with the memories of her mother's suicide one year ago and the loss of her boyfriend, Joe, who disappeared inexplicably after the news of the suicide hit. Now a year later, the small country town is in an uproar when the body of a young girl is found alongside of the road, and then another is found murdered. It seems like a serial killer is on the loose. To add to the mix, Joe is back in town, flooding Charlotte with mixed emotions and suspicions that Joe's return signals doom for her and her friends. Oh my god, the giant is a absolute painful watch, I'm sorry to say. Every scene oozes with emo teen pretension. This hour and 39 minute film feels double its length because of how slow the cast moves and speaks. Cigarettes are smoked slowly while people gaze out into the darkness slowly. A slow walk across the room takes forever. Words turd out of the mouths of this young cast that have barely enough energy to stay vertical. This film drones on, hoping to come off as deep, but never achieving it. Apparently the giant is supposed to occur somewhere in between Charlotte's dreams and her reality, rarely indicating when this shift occurs. The sleepy speak gets progressively slower as the film goes on, and there might be some hidden meaning, but filmmaker David Raboy fails to make a film worth paying attention to so we can care. He also forgets to give this film any semblance of a plot. There is some kind of impending doom coming on over the horizon. Charlotte calls it the giant, and occasionally we're shown a shadow in the clouds or a movement in the trees that symbolically indicates something big is coming. If there had been some kind of big payoff to all of this listless shambling about, the giant might have redeemed itself. The final moments, though, lead up to a non-ending that makes you wonder why in the hell you wasted so much time watching this film. I'm sorry, I usually like independent films, and I don't mind the dreamlike speak that often occurs in films from David Lynch. But films aren't supposed to be an endurance test. And that's what the giant turns out to be. Raboy's cinematography is nice when he isn't too close to the actors, capturing images that are barely lit and visible, or aimlessly drifting the camera off target as if the filmmaker himself has dozed off. The giant wants to be deep, but it turns out to be the film equivalent of a douchebag who brings his guitar to the party just waiting for someone to ask him to play. All of it feels like fluff on a cracker made of pure pretension. Don't get suckered into watching this film from the intriguing trailer. It's going to infuriate you and bore you all at once. Though it is low budget, I'd rather watch 10 lo-fi versions of Backwoods any day of the week before I watch The Giant again. 
Backwoods is new on demand and digital download from Gravitas Ventures. It's directed by Thomas Smith and written by Thomas Smith and Aaron Lilly. Head cheerleader Molly, played by Isabella Alberti, is dating star footballer Hunter, played by Matthew McCoy, but has a soft spot for the water boy and longtime friend Noah, played by Michael Anthony Bagazzi. So she invites the outcast to a party. This party just so happens to be taking place in the middle of a woods that once was the hunting grounds of an urban legend named the Hangman. When it seems someone has drugged Molly at the party, Noah tries to help her, but ends up getting into a fight with Hunter. Fleeing to the woods, the trio end up running into the Hangman, who is very much alive and very deadly. Backwoods, in a, Backwoods is an extremely low-budget movie, but that doesn't mean it's worth checking Backwoods is an extremely low-budget movie, but that doesn't mean it isn't worth checking out. The story is ambitious, as it flips back and forth through the narrative, playing with our expectations and going for some unpredictable character turns. The film opens with Molly waking up in a trunk and then backpedals, allowing us a chance to get to know the players of the story. It's a way to spice up what normally would be a somewhat predictable story, and this is somewhat successful in doing so. Still, I think the flipping back and forth in time gets to be a little extraneous the longer it goes on, especially when it becomes quite predictable as to what's happening. Nevertheless, the choice to structure the story in this way makes for an original way of telling a tale, even if some of the twists don't come off as shocking as this film wants them to be. I also like the look of our hangman, played by Scott Allen Warner. The mask and hand effects are pretty cool, even though the head appliance is pretty obviously a thick mask and doesn't really bend in all the right places. This becomes more evident the longer the camera lingers on the hangman, and unfortunately, filmmaker Thomas Smith lingers on him a lot. I think a little less screen time for the monster might have heightened his menace. He does prove to be quite menacing, using all kinds of weaponry, including shotguns and traps, and has a pretty strange life he leads in his desolate cabin in the woods. Isabella Alberti and Michael Anthony Bagazzi are the two acting standouts in Backwoods. Most of the cast suffer from low-budget local casting syndrome, where most of the cast is made up of friends and volunteers. Still, Alberti and Bagazzi are likable in the two lead roles, especially when they banter back and forth with one another. Backwoods shoots for the moon and hits its mark some of the time. I think occasionally it might think it's cleverer than it really is, But still, it delivers some fun twists and a solid monster. What else would you want from a lo-fi backwoods slasher flick? Rot is new on-demand and digital download. I watched it on Amazon. It's directed and written by Andrew Merrill. Overwhelmed by grad school responsibilities, Madison, played by Chris Alexandria, decides to break up with her boyfriend, Jesse, played by Johnny Costry. But when Jesse is infected with some kind of otherworldly evil at his hospital job, Madison is pulled back into his world, attempting to track him down after he has a seizure and then goes missing. Meanwhile, Jesse is infecting everyone that crosses his path, adding to the number of a strange army that seems to have dark designs to possess the entire world. Fans of films like They Look Like People, The Dead Sender, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, and especially Cronenberg's Shivers, are going to be the target audience for this one. Rot lacks some of the subtleties of those films, which hinge greatly on paranoia, but you can't help but think of them while watching it. Paranoia does come into play later in the story, but this one seems to focus on the initial outbreak and how that is affecting this small group of friends. It's smart to tell an intimate story, as this is a low-budget film, There's not a lot of effects work at play, but writer-director Andrew Merrill delivers some odd and unsettling sequences involving the way these infected souls interact with one another. Some of them speak freely, attempting to lure their victims in. Others stare blankly. Some even run around the room with rectalous abandon. The rules of the game are not really mapped out here, but nevertheless, these scenes, as the disease, which is spread through passing something from one mouth to another, ended up sending a shiver down my spine. It's because of the vagueness of what exactly this evil is that makes it work so well, I think. The acting in Rot feels natural, especially Alexandria and Costry. Sarah Young Chandler, Michaela Reggio, and Johnny Urochuk offer up some smaller but strong performances as the couple's friends who are trying to understand the breakup and Jesse's odd behavior. 
I'm not sure if there's some kind of under theme going on with Rot. If I were to guess, I'm thinking it might have something to do with how the ending of a relationship resonates far beyond the relationship itself. Or maybe it's about the dark feelings that emerge during a breakup. It's not exactly clear, and there's not a lot about Rot that is, to tell you the truth. This is a vague film that really doesn't explain itself at all. It may not be successful in delivering a definite evil, but it definitely succeeds at a feeling of uncomfortable paranoia and an ooky sense of body horror. If that's enough for you, you're the audience for Rot. Werewolf, aka Wilkolak, is new on-demand and digital download from Uncorked Entertainment. It's written and directed by Adrian Penick. A group of Polish children who survived the end of World War II are taken to an orphanage in the middle of the woods. When their caretaker is killed by a pack of feral dogs that were let loose by the Nazis at the end of the war, the children are forced to take refuge in the castle without food or water. With the dogs circling the castle outside, desperation sets in, and the kids are forced to become primitive in order to survive. Werewolf is a quiet yet complex and subtle tale of survival. Rich in symbolism, the film shows the devastating effects of war on the children as they scramble for the smallest bits of food and act like animals themselves. While the hope of some kind of love and home is promised to them, it is quickly taken away when their caretaker is killed and they have to survive on their own. Playing out like a twisted version of Lord of the Flies, it's a brilliant and saddening look at how fragile civility is given the right desperate circumstances. At the same time, this film takes a more intimate look at this theme through the portrayal of three of the children. Wladek, played by Camille Polnisiak, is a shy and savvy boy whose ingenuity shines when he trains the rest of the children to salute and bow down to the Nazis when they invade their shelter during the war. This move of subservience proves to save the children at the beginning of the film, but it's the same theory that Wladek adheres to as he begins to want the approval of the Nazis even more, almost idolizing their actions and believing too much in their cause. It makes him an outsider among the children later in the film, though his actions serve to save them in the beginning. This abandonment by his peers leads to resentment when a more alpha male, Hans, played by the very river phoenixy Nicholas Prisgoda, joins the group. Hans enters the group as the bully, picking on Wladek for his role of the leader and taking control of the group. Hans and Wladek also come into conflict over Hanka, played by Sonia Mitalika, who is the oldest girl in the group and garners the affections of both boys. Hanka, though, is interested in adopting the maternal role of the group, shying away advances from both boys. These complex roles make for an interesting internal conflict for the story, and much of the runtime is dedicated to the subtle dance these three make as the affections are gained and shunned, and the roles of leadership are passed on and shifted once new perils arise. When the threat of the dogs encircling the castle becomes apparent, the roles shift again, and simple survival forces petty differences to dissolve. While each of the three children react in a different way to the threat, all three prove to be important in overcoming this terrible situation. The result is a quiet but powerful ending that resonates on an emotional, symbolic, and sheer gut level as the children make their final standoff against the pack. The final moments of Werewolf prove to be extremely resonant, letting the audience know that the horrors of war last long after the final bullet is fired. Finally, we go all the way over to Sweden for our last pick, Coco Di Coco Da. It's new on-demand and digital download from Dark Star Pictures. This film was directed and written by Johannes Nyholm. Describing Coco D. Coco Da is a disservice, as I feel it's a nightmarish art film that should kind of be witnessed and experienced yourself in order to really get the gist of it. If you like nightmarish art house films reminiscent of the work of David Lynch, Panos Cosmatos, and especially Yorgos Lanthimos, this film reminds me a lot of a mixture of their work. I'm going to go into what I took away as the meaning of Coco di Coco da, but I suggest you watch the movie depending on your liking of the aforementioned directors, and then come back and let me know what you think what it all means. Coco di Coco da is a repetitious nightmare scenario where a couple, grieving from the loss of their only daughter, find themselves trapped in a time loop where they encounter a trio of murderous oddballs in the woods and keep getting killed by them over and over again. Obvious references to Groundhog's Day, Happy Death Day, and the more recent Vivarium can be made, 
but this Swedish-Danish film seems more like a dream that you just can't escape from. As the story goes on, the couple become aware of their plight, making each scene different from one another, even though they start out in the exact same way. Through some imaginative shadow puppetry, some kind of resolution is reached. Literal thinkers might want to take off at this point, because Coco di Coco da is a surreal experience with dream logic being utilized pretty much from the 20 minute mark on. After a devastating loss filmed in a cold and stark manner, the couple find themselves trapped in their own nightmare. While it's a film open to interpretation, here's what I got from it. Filmmaker Johannes Nyholm seems to want to illustrate the monotony of depression and loss. The repeated scenario where the couple faces their end is symbolic, as the three murderous characters they encounter in the woods are illustrated on the music box they bought for their daughter before they died whistling the titular musical tone hauntingly before murdering the couple over and again. No matter what direction they choose to run or method of fighting back they utilize, it always ends in the death of both of them. I believe this signifies the death of the couple's relationship once their daughter is gone, an inevitability no matter what course of action they take. There is a resolution. This couple isn't trapped in this loop forever, or are they? But in order to get out, much acceptance and soul-searching is required in order for them to even try to move on. The final moments of Coco di Coco da are haunting, but it could also be seen as somewhat uplifting as the couple seem to understand and accept the horrors of their past and present. Though where they go from there is left unanswered. Despite what meaning you adhere to Coco di Coco da, I found it to be a highly imaginative and terrifying experience. I understand why others might hate this film, but for me the unapologizing insanity of the woods people who attacked the couple and the ultimate despair the couple feel in this scenario was communicated in a way that hit me on an extremely primal level. Paired with some rock-solid acting by the entire small cast, the film is something that latches onto you and exudes a sense of unease and dread that you just won't be able to shake. If you don't mind that feeling, I think you'll like this film. If you want to forget a movie, just as the credits roll, this one is going to be something you'll want to skip. Many people try to do an art house film and fail miserably as it feels pretentious. As if the filmmaker is screaming, look at how weird and clever I am. See the earlier review of The Giant for a perfect example. Coco di Coco da isn't one of those films. This is the work of a true talent in Johannes Nyholm, who sheds light on the uncomfortable, the intimate, the shames and the regrets we don't want to acknowledge to deliver a symbolic night trap of a film that needs some brain flexing to understand, but still resonates on a lizard brain level that is undeniably unshakable. Plus, I guarantee you'll come out of this film with the Coco di Coco da tune burrowed in your head. That'll be it for today. Please chime in in the comments and let me know what you think of this video, how on the nose or mind-numbingly wrong I am, or you can counter with your own review. If you like this video, please pound that thumbs up button, share this video with your social media addicted pals, if you're looking for written reviews you can find them on mlmillerwrites.com, don't forget I have two new horror comic book trade paperbacks you should look for. Grave Transfers is out right now, and Pirouette, collecting never-before-published issues, will be out in November in only the finest of comic book stores. And be sure to subscribe to this channel, and ring that bell for alerts to be the first to see my future videos. Thank you so much for your time, and take care. You're Stuck inside your reality, your